today I am awake. The sun is out. It's a beautiful day and I'm actually conscious. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I suffer from quite a fair amount of SAD in the middle of winter. Seasonal affective disorder, just basically not, yeah, I'm not a big fan of winter. That's the way I'm gonna put it. Anyway, so I wanted to talk about SpaceX and I basically originally shot this video about three weeks ago. So last time I tried to shoot this video, I was a few days away from the Crew-1 launch that SpaceX did. They've now done that and it went very well so far. Now I'm a few days away from the Starship SN8 prototype launch and that is going to be at least as exciting. In fact, actually it's probably gonna be an awful lot more exciting than Crew-1 because obviously with Crew-1, human lives were at stake and we were all hoping for a really boring but nominal launch. This time, it's fireworks. Maybe, or it could just be absolutely spectacular technology from the future, who knows? But the question is, why is all this stuff important? What's it really going to do for the average person on the street? Why, why are we bothering? Why is Elon Musk pouring so much money in? And these are all very good questions, which I'm hoping to answer today. Although, I'm actually not going to reshoot the video. I shot it before, I just, it got dark and dismal and rainy and cold and I am not a big fan of winter. However, the sun is out today, so this is my one opportunity to get this video up. Ah, right, we're now going to cut back to what I shot two weeks ago before the Crew-1 launch. Good morning and welcome. My name's James Cook, let's vlog. Today I wanna to talk about space. First though, I need to finish walking this dog. process of moving. So what I'm doing is I'm just bringing stuff over from this load of bits and bobs in the garage. I'm just bringing it over one load at a time in order to sort of sort it and you know hopefully not just move the junk from one house to another. That's what I've done the whole of my life so far. I just seal up the box, move it to the next house. But not this time. This time I'm going through it. So I, I was watching a, a Scott Manley YouTube video. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a relatively big YouTuber, basically covers space and quite a sort of technical level and uh, quite often related to historical space events, but not always. In this case, he was doing a video about how the recent election in the US might affect NASA's funding and the, the politics of space, that sort of thing. And that's not what I want to talk about at all. But one of the things that, that he mentioned in that video, which stuck in my mind, was that somebody had left a comment. It goes along the lines of, why are we spending so much money on space and space technologies when there are so many problems here on Earth for us to fix? And it's a very valid point. Well, except for just a couple of things. Firstly, as Scott Manley pointed out, if you spend money on space, you by default spend it on Earth, at least until Elon Musk's Mars colony becomes a, a reality at some point in the future. But until that time, if you spend money, it's here on Earth. It supports jobs and industries and communities. And that's one of the reasons why SLS still exists at all. I think that's a bit of a, a red herring of an argument. To, to say that it's got anything to do with where you spend the money. Surely the point of something is not where you're spending the money, usually, it's why you're spending the money, what you expect to get out the other side. The point of investing in space technology has got to be something that that space technology does or enables you to do that you otherwise couldn't do. Elon Musk's reason for wanting to push space technology forwards is to do with the survival of the species. I do think that's a valid reason, but I don't think that's the reason why everyday people are gonna care about that sort of thing. I need to nip over to the garage first and grab some more stuff to sort through. Because we're, we're getting to the point where 
you know, this place is going to be sold hopefully soon, touch wood. The nice thing about old houses is wood everywhere. So what's the current state of space technology? What's it helped us with so far? Yeah. <laughs> so apart from the usual things that everyone knows that space has helped us with, things like the digital image sensor in this camera. That was something that was developed because film is not so great for space. Mainly because you can't transmit film. You have to physically recover it, which is very expensive in space. But there has actually been a huge number of things that space exploration has really helped humanity with in terms of developing stuff. You've got advances in computing, advances in obviously global positioning. That's a massive one. We use that all the time. It is so, it is so fundamental to so many aspects of how the world works these days. Actually, GPS is a really good example because that's one of those technologies which we wouldn't have a, we wouldn't even bother conceiving of it until we developed launches that were actually capable of putting multiple tons into a medium Earth orbit. And having done that, having developed that technology, it then enabled us to put up those GPS satellites, which is what so much of our critical infrastructure is now based around. I think you're gonna see a similar thing with Starship actually, but we're gonna get back to that in a little bit. We're gonna go grab some lunch now. Good old McDonald's, because the local pub has run out of delivery slots for Sunday lunch. More recently, developments have been sort of focused on the, the concept of reusability. In fact, in about a week's time, Rocket Lab are going to be attempting the recovery of their first stage of an, their Electron rocket. And it's gonna be the first time they've ever attempted a recovery of this. It comes down on parachutes. It doesn't do an entry burn or a landing burn or any of those SpaceX-y type things. But it's a lot smaller and lighter than a Falcon 9, which is, in theory, how it can get through the wall, the, the atmosphere getting really thick, really quick, as the rocket descends. The Electron is, of course, a small sat launcher, so it tends to launch very small payloads, a couple of hundred kilos into low Earth orbit. It has got its photon upper stage, kick stage now, which it basically is almost like a mini, well it is, it's a mini spacecraft in its own right, which can maneuver a payload around and put it in exactly the orbit that the customer wants it to go in. It's, it's, it's a cool piece of technology, it really is, it's awesome. And the cost of the launches is, is really quite small as well. So it's a, it's a significant step forwards. SLS, that's another thing that's going on. It's a little bit, SLS is, that's kind of a white elephant, let's be honest. It's not even moving technology forwards particularly because for the most part, they're using old tech from space shuttles. They're using the RS-25 engines from the space shuttle. They're using the side boosters, five segment instead of four for the space shuttle, but it's the same technology. And it's costing a fortune because you can't just reuse rocket technology. You've got to actually put some effort into making sure that it won't just blow up in this slightly altered use case. So yeah, I'm not a big fan of SLS or for that matter, a big fan of spending money on it. I think for the most part, the only real benefit of SLS, other than the fact that it does give us access, human rated access to lunar orbit. But other than that, it doesn't really move the dial at all, other than helping to support the local communities that, that build the various different bits. And then of course you've got SpaceX with the Falcon 9 and their Falcon Heavy. And I really love these because I feel like they have properly moved the bar forwards in technology terms. I mean, this is the first orbital class booster that not only lands propulsively, but then gets reused. So far they're up to, I think, six uses of a single booster, which is just game changing. And it's been really hard for SpaceX to get there. It's been a, a long slog of iteratively improving the engines, the structure, the composite pressure vessels that they have inside the tanks. It, it's just, it, and the control software. I mean, obviously there's the software that controls these rockets and the sensors that they use, the avionics, 
is just, it's a significant step forwards. And it's enabled something that before the Falcon 9 was basically a pipe dream. And that is the idea of a low Earth orbit constellation of communication satellites. You see, the thing about a low Earth orbit constellation is you can't get away with four or 16 or 20 or a relatively small number of satellites. I believe the GLONASS system has only got something like 20 something satellites in that constellation. And you can get away with that sort of thing because those satellites are a much higher orbit than say, for example, a Starlink satellite, which is a communication satellite. And to reduce the latency as much as possible, they want them as close to Earth as possible, which means they whiz across the sky really quickly which means you need lots and lots of them. That's why even with 800 satellites in their initial constellation, it's still only enough for okay-ish coverage if you're in a really northern latitude. Yeah, they're gonna be going to like 12,000, 42,000, some enormous number of satellites at some stage. And you can only really dream about putting that many individual satellites in orbit. If you have a launch system which is reasonably cheap and easy and quick to launch. There we go. Have a hand shortage, because of all this Sunday lunch. Let's take food production, for example, right? We could try and invest billions and billions of pounds, dollars, whatever, into creating some sort of artificial meat protein. In fact, to be honest, there are lots of people that are investing huge amounts of money into that because ultimately growing cows in order to make beef burgers is really, really inefficient from an energy, space and general resources point of view. So yeah, that's not ideal because we all like burgers. <laughs> yeah. I had a nice Big Mac just then, it was a-okay. But the amount of water and land required to make that burger is just bonkers. Here's the thing though, growing cows for meat on Mars is basically a non-starter. What they would do is they would look for an artificial means to create that meat patty, something that didn't involve cows. And they are working on that right now but the problem is whenever they come across something which probably is a pretty reasonable you know it's not bad it's not bad but it only tastes half as nice as real meat so we won't bother if you're on mars that doesn't taste half as nice as real meat it suddenly becomes the nicest meat you've ever tasted because it's the only meat you get to taste and now because they're producing it in quantity for people that want and, and, and appreciate it, the quality will go up and over time it'll go from 50% tastes as good as real meat to 100% tastes as good as real meat or thereabouts. At which point we will no longer need to grow cows in order to make hamburgers, which I think is a win for basically everybody except the cows. So what wonderful new things are right around the corner from a space point of view? Well, you've got Artemis, as we already sort of talked briefly about that with the SLS, which I don't think the SLS itself particularly moves the bar forwards, but the Gateway space station is actually quite interesting. It's probably, I would say, almost less of a gateway and more of a little mini spacecraft in its own right. So I do think there's some, there's some useful development that will go into creating that and it will hopefully also give us an ability to access different areas on the moon quite easily. Hopefully we'll be able to find some water, maybe get the in situ resource utilization system going. That's you know how you create rocket fuel on the moon with nothing but a bit of water and some electricity, that kind of thing. And it, that technology will be extremely useful right here on Earth. Even more so, the, the version on Mars where you try and create methane from CO2 and water, that, that is extremely useful here on Earth because methane, if we can get to grips with how to store and use this relatively dense energy source, that could be a carbon neutral way of powering planes. You fix the CO2 and water out of the atmosphere and make methane with it using the Sabatier process and then you fuel your aircraft and that spits out CO2 and water into the atmosphere 
as it's going along. All you have to do is put in energy and the energy can be from the sun or geothermal or wind or basically any kind of renewable source that you like. What's the big problem with renewables? Storage. Power storage, that is the big problem. It's also a problem that spacecraft continually have to deal with because although when you're in deep space, you tend to get pretty much uninterrupted sun, or at least you do whilst you're within the solar system, that sun may not be as powerful as it is here on Earth, especially if you're further away. And if you're orbiting a planet, then there is definitely going to be light and dark cycles to contend with. If you're on a planet, there will definitely be light and dark cycles. Mars has got a very similar length day to Earth, so any technology you design to keep the lights on at night in Mars is a technology which will also keep the lights on at night in on Earth. And then you have the Moon, where they have a much longer, I think it's something like 14 day days, if you know what I mean, and 14 night nights. The days and the nights on the Moon are very long. And that means that you really do have to have an incredible energy storage source or some other way of generating power. Maybe a little fission reactor or fusion reactor or something like that. But the development of these technologies, that's the real key. And SpaceX, with the Starship and Super Heavy vehicle that they're designing and building as we speak right now, I think that really moves it forward in, like it's a whole new step change. We can't even predict what sort of things might come off the back of that. So that's how I think space can really help. I think that most of the problems that are intractable on Earth tend to be fixed if you can master space. Because the technological bar is so high for anything space travel related. I mean, just like, look how much trouble we've been having trying to design a vehicle that can take us into low Earth orbit and come back again and not expend any of the vehicle except fuel and other consumables. I mean, at the moment, rockets are the consumable. It's insane. I mean, no wonder access to low Earth orbit is such a expensive, difficult thing to do. That's where Starship really comes into its own because it's not so much, I mean, the technology is necessary for developing Starship. They are very important, but that's not the real payoff from something like Starship. The real payoff from something like Starship is that it gives you that really, really cheap access to low Earth orbit. I, you know, a couple of million dollars for a hundred tons into low Earth orbit is what they're sort of talking about eventually. That would just be so totally game-changing. It is impossible to predict what kind of technologies, what kind of industrializations, what kind of interest is going to be generated and, and opportunities. The opportunities, you just can't predict them. You have to actually build the technology before you can see what it's going to be used for. I suppose in a way it's a little bit like the laser in that respect. When they first developed the laser, they didn't really know what they were going to use it for. But, you know, then it became very popular for things like reading and writing to CDs. I know that's a bit past it now. We don't really do that anymore. But back in the day, that was very important. In fact, actually, Starlink is going to be using lasers in order to communicate in space at light speed between different Starlink satellites. That's something which I think they have actually tested now. They sent a few hundred gigabytes across from one satellite to the other. For the most part though, the Starlink satellites at the moment are just basically from the ground up to the satellite, back down to a base station that's connected to the internet. So the satellites are effectively acting as relays and just helping to connect your remote area to a less remote base station which can be 10, 20 miles away. Eventually, they'll be able to send data all the way around the world, Starlink to Starlink via laser, and that's where you start to talk about the really, really low latency speeds and communication speeds between continents. And it should be quicker than fiber optics because the light goes significantly quicker through a vacuum than it does through the glass of a, of, of a fiber optic cable. So in conclusion, I think space is about exploration. I think a lot of people have felt that that is always the sort of the the thing about space is it's about exploration and so I think a lot of people are sort of like well we've been to the moon we've sent robots to Mars we've got satellites and probes heading in various different directions throughout the solar system checking out the moons of Saturn and Jupiter and all the rest of it and yes okay so there's a lot of exploration going on 
But that's not the kind of exploration that I think really pays off for humanity. It pays off for science, and eventually, in terms of understanding of the universe, it does pay off. But in a practical, everyday sense, the real payoff is building the technologies. So effectively, what I'm saying is that the solutions to the problems on Earth are found in space, possibly. And the reason why it's exploration is because we don't know what solutions we'll find out there. But one thing I can promise you is the challenge is so great mastering space that you can't not solve most of the problems on Earth in order to get there. Awesome. Yeah, for me, space is all about exploration. The exploration of the possible. And that's why I get so excited about it, because I'm always excited to see what's coming and how it's going to affect humanity and how it's going to move us forwards. That's, that's I think, the thing that really gets me going. It's one of the reasons why I'm so into electric vehicles and renewable energy and stuff like that, because I really feel that's helping to move us forwards in a, in a really concrete way, in a way that just having a slightly faster petrol car or a slightly more efficient petrol car, it's not, you know, that's not changing anything. It just means you can have slightly more petrol cars on the road. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's video and found it interesting. If you have, remember to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you don't already. I also want to say a massive thank you to my Patreons because you guys are awesome. And I will see you in the next episode of my vlog. Bye. That's not going to work. Need to not, ooh, ooh, yeah, if I go up too high, it's not going to work. So, um, maybe the solution is just to move this up. Okay, that'll do. I look forward to having a studio where I can have all this permanently set up. Yeah, okay, right, let's crack on.